Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Martin Rees, President of the Royal Society, and it's my great privilege to welcome you to this lecture on science policy. It's the fourth in a series that the Prime Minister is undertaking on the general theme of our nation's future. Scientists are understanding the world more deeply, and their work is changing the world faster than ever, and it impinges on more areas than ever of public policy. And this country, of course, punches way above its weight in science. And this government has a declared aim to make Britain a destination of choice for global science and innovation, a magnet for mobile talent and inward investment. And we have a head start, but to sustain it, we must confront growing competition, not just from the US, but from the Far East. Crucial to this, of course, is the percolation of ideas and of people between universities, businesses, and the public sector. Our universities generate new ideas, they're networked with the whole world's research, they train students whose diverse careers spread expertise throughout society, and innovative firms cluster around them. And the news is good. At school level, there are improvements, but science education does still have some disquieting weaknesses. And remedying these must remain a top priority. And the Royal Society welcomes the commitment of DFES, DTI and the Treasury to this cause and the government's recent STEM report. In particular, I also welcome the six formers in the audience. I hope some will become scientists, but not necessarily all of them because it's important that science education isn't just for future scientists. How science is applied concerns all of us. We're confronted with ever more environmental, ethical and economic choices. And genuine public engagement requires well-informed citizens and a realistic appraisal of risk. Otherwise, political debate won't rise above the level of tabloid slogans. We are all right to be mindful of the potential downside of some new technology. But the primary grounds, in my view, are for being upbeat. Two transformational technologies of this decade and the drivers of economic growth are information technology and biotech. <coughs> Both of these can potentially benefit the developing world as well as the developed world. New science offers real hope for tackling global issues, health, energy, and the environment. The Prime Minister's effective leadership at the G8 shows that the UK government, backed by sound scientific advice, can have real global leverage. There's no greater need for this, incidentally, than in implementing the course charted in the Stern Report on climate change that was announced earlier this week. Al Gore said of this, we mustn't leap from denial to despair, we can do something and we must. Supplying the entire world with clean, low carbon energy is a massive long-term challenge. It's a goal that resonates with the intellect and idealism of the young. The technologies to do this haven't all been developed yet. Some haven't even been conceived. And I can't think of much that could do more to attract the brightest and best young people into science than a proclaimed national commitment to take a lead in meeting this challenge. <coughs> in this country's own interest, the UK should surely seize the chance to play a pivotal role. Insofar as we can build further on our present successes in science and innovation, the law of increasing returns will apply. Talent attracts talent. Excellence clusters together. Over most of the lifetime of this government, there are two people who've been, as it were, at the cusp of science policy. Lord Sainsbury as Minister and Sir David King as Chief Scientific Advisor. They've both earned broad bipartisan respect for all they've achieved, and it's good they're here today, sitting in the front row. On the platform, we've got two 
senior scientist from outside government. Dame Julia Higgins is Vice President of Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society and she's also Principal of the Faculty of Engineering at Imperial College. <coughs> Professor John Burland is also from Imperial College and he's an engineer who chairs the Royal Society Innovation Panel. And they'll be making brief remarks before the Prime Minister gives his lecture. I'm going to call on Julia in a moment, but before that, just some housekeeping. Please turn off your mobile phones. Please note where the fire exits are. And for anyone with hearing aids, there is a hearing loop. So, let me, without all more ado, uh, ask uh, Julia Higgins to make uh, some brief remarks. Thank you. Well, as the President said, I'm Foreign Secretary at the Royal Society, and I've therefore had the pleasure for nearly five years of leading the inter international activity there. An international perspective is not an add-on, but fundamentally important to the science in the UK, because we have to remember, however good we are, 95% of the science takes place elsewhere, and we must interact with it. Science has, of course, always been international, and the Royal Society has long carried out a range of international activities. From the very start of our nearly 350 years history, we supported the sharing of information of the latest research between scholars in the United Kingdom and internationally. Indeed, I should remark, the Royal Society has had a Foreign Secretary for considerably longer than this nation has had a Foreign Secretary. <laughs> this tradition continues now with the publication of our seven journals, but more specifically in a broad programme of international exchanges, which we support to promote in scientific collaboration. Each year we fund over 650 partnerships between researchers in this country and those based overseas. We've also had a strong role in delivering high quality science policy advice to this government and others. Recently we've shown global leadership in the international dimension of policy advice as well. We are members of the Inter-Academy Inter Panel which brings together 91 of the world's science academies and through our membership we produced influential statements on issues as diverse as the teaching on evolution and stem cell research and cloning. Following the Prime Minister's initiative on putting climate change and Africa at the heart of the UK's G8 presidency, we led an initiative of the G8 academies, together with those of China, India, Brazil and Africa. We published joint statements on those priority themes. This initiative was continued by the Russian Academy of Sciences under the Russian G8 Presidency, and we understand Germany will be doing the same. This activity showed the importance and the value of international cooperation on advisory activity. We must ensure that the voice of the global science community is heard by governments and decision makers around the world. The challenge in the future is how the UK will react to the effects of globalisation. <coughs> We realise that the increased capacity of developing countries may cause a potential shift of global force away from the West. We, the Royal Society, are enthusiastic participants in David King's cross-departmental Global Science and Innovation Forum. GSIF, as it's affectionately known, has recently launched its new international strategy. This aims to ensure a more coordinated approach among UK stakeholders and thus lead to greater and more lasting benefit to the UK and the UK science base from all of these activities. Internationally, we are very well positioned at the moment, but we need to continue to be visionary and ambitious in our approach in the future to ensure that we're able to maintain the global position and the influence that goes with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Can I invite John Berlin to speak now? I really want to make two points in the five minutes I've been allocated. The first relates to science and innovation, and the second to science education. And I want to talk from my own experience in these two areas. The term science base is often used 
but as a member of a profession that's concerned with dam design and water supply, I think of the base as a reservoir of scientific expertise, experience and knowledge. Science is just as much about people as it is about ideas. Over the last nine years, the government has made very substantial increases in public investment, which has helped to keep the UK science reservoir vibrant and fresh. What about innovation and the commercial exploitation of this reservoir? I have the privilege of being on the judges panel of the Robert Award, the premier UK award for engineering innovation. In this capacity, I have visited many companies in the last two years, and it really is thrilling to witness the breadth and the depth of scientific and engineering innovation in the UK, and to share the excitement of it all. The dramatic increase in the number of university spin-outs is also all too evident. Talking to the people involved, you will also become aware of the really tough challenges of bringing innovations to the market. It is a tough, hard job. And two key issues emerge time and time again. The first is finance for proof of concept. And the second is appointing a chief executive with the appropriate business and entrepreneurial skills. The Royal Society Brian Mercer Awards are aimed at funding proof of concept innovations in the areas of nanotechnology <coughs> and the environment. Also this year, together with Imperial College's Tanaka Business School, the Royal Society has run a most successful training programme to help young scientists to work more effectively with business and to target the market with their research. Much larger funded initiatives of these types are needed. And then just a word about science education. Sir Charles Inglis, in the 1940s, was head of engineering at Cambridge. I really, sorry, was head of engineering at the other place. <laughs> once remarked, he once remarked that a university education is instilling that habit of mind which is retained when, ev ev when everything you have been taught has been forgotten. Now, two comments on that. One, I believe this applies equally to schools, not just universities. And I echo the President's welcome to so many sixth formers. It is great to have you here. And the other comment is, that in this age of rapid technological development, you can replace has been forgotten with has changed. That habit of mind in science is the scientific method, which is a rigorous intellectual discipline. And talking to schools about some of the exciting engineering projects that I have worked on, it quickly becomes apparent that engineering uses and builds on the scientific method. Engineering is not second-rate science. It is ingenious and creative science. Good science teaching instills that habit of mind, which is not only vital to science, and technology, but to many walks of life. The UK has a desperate need of good science teachers to empower the next generation. Thank you.
you, John. It's now my privilege to invite the Prime Minister to give his lecture. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with you this morning um, and to say how pleased I am that um, Martin and Julia and John kindly agreed to, to help me this, today. Um, this is a subject I absolutely uh, love to speak about, but my pleasure in speaking about it is in inverse proportion to my expertise. Um, so I'm really delighted that you, you come along. And Martin, of course, has, has made the journey uh, over from the other place. Uh, we gave him his passport again here earlier today. Um, Martin, thank you so much for, for everything you do on behalf of the Royal Society. Um, Julia, who um, I thought you were, I thought it was a slip of the tongue when you described her as the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, but you, you, Martin is just informing me that this is a, a position that's been there for many, many years and dates back to Christopher Wren and Galileo and all sorts. Um, and John, thank you very much indeed for the inspiring words you spoke about the importance of science and education, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And thank you also to the, the King Centre for allowing us to, to give the lecture here. Um, this is a, a building that was used for science and is now hosts the community of local churches. I mean, we're very used to things happening kind of the other way around, but, um, and perhaps it's not. Well, I personally think there's no conflict between faith and science, but anyway, that's another um, debate for a, another lecture. Um, I'm also very, very uh, honoured to have with us uh, David Sainsbury, the science minister, who's done a, just an amazing job in, in this field. Um, Sir David King is the chief scientific advisor, and um, he's, he's the person who, when I, have, when I have the meetings with him, I, it's one of those meetings I really enjoy. I feel like I learn something every time I have a conversation with him, mainly because he makes it um, roughly comprehensible for me. And uh, John Krebs is also here, and many other dis distinguished people. Um, and I have to say to you that probably for, for me, giving this lecture today, uh, there's no one who would be more surprised to hear of my passion for science than my old science teachers. Um, in fact, I do actually recall my physics paper at school, um, in respect of which my physics teacher said that the word hopeless was inadequate to describe. <laughs> um, I was actually not so much uh, poor at science as a refusenik about it. I felt I never understood it and it never understood me. I had difficulty with the concepts, couldn't master the basics, let alone the more complex theories, and never saw its practical benefit. Science, for me at that time, seemed for people devoid of emotion, the boffins, the ones who took an extraordinary interest in things I found irritating. And yet today, I'm <coughs> practically born again on the subject. In later life, I've become fascinated by scientific process, its reasoning, deduction, and evidence-based analysis, inspired by scientific progress and excited by scientific possibility. And therefore, I've become determined, um, almost if I can say it in these surroundings, evangelical, that the attitude I now regret from my youth should not be the attitude of young people today. Yesterday, I visited a small but growing high-tech company run by engineers turned entrepreneurs who showed me two examples of their work. The first was a device for measuring the quality and temperature of beer as it is drawn from the barrel to the glass. Very practical, materialistic even, but hopefully commercial. The second, the real object of the visit, was to see how they were developing pure plant oil to run diesel engines, but with very much reduced levels of carbon emissions. This is visionary stuff, directly linked to saving our planet, but also, hopefully, commercial. And in that small company are represented the many faces of science today. Invention, practical application, commercial development, and moral impulse. Later, I visited the quite extraordinary synchrotron facility, a vast, giant source of light that in the most microscopic detail allows us to break down and analyse the composition of material. Built in partnership with money from 
the government and the Wellcome Trust. Formed as an independent company, it's staffed from virtually every corner of the globe. It is at the leading edge of scientific possibility. Just in a short time, I heard what it could help with, from the storage of ever larger amounts of information, to helping cure HIV AIDS, to even deciphering how a piece of pottery from ancient Rome was made and where the materials for it were sourced. It's a kind of gigantic enabler, if you like. And all of this is very interesting, but it is also utterly critical to our economy. We talk of Britain's future as being a knowledge economy, by which we mean an economy where we do not compete on wages, how can we, when Chinese labour costs are 5% of ours, but on intelligence, on innovation, on creativity. Intense economic restructuring is happening here and around the world in similar economies. Basic functions are being outsourced. Call centres, for example, have come, but in some cases are now going. Manufacturing is having to revolutionise virtually every decade just to stand still. Financial capital and technology are mobile. It's human capital that is what it's all about. In my judgment, for Britain, science will be as important to our economic future as stability. We have to be a magnet for scientific endeavour, attracting the best people, turning the knowledge into commercial enterprise, forming the collaborations here, in Europe, across the world, that keep us right at the frontiers that science is perpetually staking out. We've come a long way in the past 10 years. Science is in many ways the secret success story of the government, but we need to do much more. In particular, we need our young people today to embrace science enthusiastically, to realise that challenges like climate change can only be beaten by motivated and dedicated scientists, and to understand that a career in science today is not a life all spent in a laboratory, but has the best business and job prospects the modern world can offer. Science today abounds both with noble causes and glittering prizes. Reach out for both. <coughs> and in doing all of this, we also need to take on and defeat the vestiges of anti-science. This won't be done by lofty superiority, but by engagement with the street, with science out there talking, debating, listening and educating. Of course, these debates aren't new. In 1959, in Cambridge, C.P. Snow famously suggested that there exist in this country two separate cultures, all but unknown to each other of the sciences and of the arts. It was, he said, somehow culturally acceptable to be ignorant of the second law of thermodynamics in a way in which ignorance of Shakespeare was not. Nearly half a century on, the sciences have become more specialised and popular understanding of its intricacies is, if anything, even worse. And yet the idea of two cultures today seems completely outdated. Science cannot any longer be detached from the society that houses it. Its influence is too pervasive for that. Every area of policy today has a scientific aspect. Think of the big questions of our time, as Martin was just saying, climate change or the spread of infectious diseases, water supply, biodiversity, even terrorism. We will need to consult the scientists over each and every one. Think of how, over the last century, some of the following discoveries have transformed our lives. MRI scanning, developed, I think, in this very building. The contraceptive pill, modern infertility treatment, ultrasound scan for unborn babies, unlocking the double helix structure of DNA, keyhole surgery, placing fluoride in the water supply, the portable defibrillator, the hepatitis B vaccine, strained quantum well lasers which contain the information used in CDs, DVDs, and the internet, DNA fingerprinting, a whole speech could be given that amounted to nothing more than a list of examples. Indeed, I don't know whether any of you have come across 
the extraordinary um, production that has been done by, I have to say, the Sun newspaper and the Science Museum. Now, there is an unlikely collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> it's just worth, if you want me to get back. I haven't, I haven't laughed so much for a long time since I read this. Just to give you a few examples of what um, joys lie in store for this. This is the Sun newspaper going back through the ages and writing out the scientific discoveries as they would have been. How about this one from July 240 BC? Headlined, You Streaker, Outrage at Archimedes' Naked Dash. <laughs> Mass genius Archimedes caused outrage yesterday by dashing naked through the street, shouting at the top of his voice. The 47-year-old eccentric shocked neighbours in Syracuse, Sicily by yelling, Eureka, meaning I've found it. Last night he apologised for the incident, but he absurdly claimed that he could not contain himself once he realised the amount of water he displaced in his bath was equal to the volume of that part of his body which was submerged. <laughs> One angry neighbour said, that won't wash. I don't, care how, I don't care how clever he is or how excited he got in his bath, grown men do not run down the street naked. <laughs> or... From, um, from November the 25th, 1859, Monkey Nutter, Barmy Botham Darwin, reckons we're all descended from apes. <laughs> Mad scientist Charles Darwin caused fury last night, claiming we're all descended from apes. Furious scientist last night insisted he does not have a shred of real evidence, and church chief said he was belittling the Bible and the importance of man over animals. Or, even more extraordinary, on page 79 of this uh, wonderful booklet, uh, which incidentally has got the sun headlines but also then a very good <coughs> description from the science museum of what the actual science is the sun from 1896 page 3 exposed are stunners as you've never seen them before thanks to the wonders of x-rays discovered last year by German scientist Wilhelm Röntgen you'll find out the intimate secrets that only their osteopaths can possibly know <laughs> What really tickles their funny bones, and if their knee bones are really connected to their thigh bones, <laughs> make no bones about it, it's the best page three series yet, you'd be after your skull to miss it. <laughs> so it is possible, I think, occasionally, um, to have some, sorry, I should probably, rather than advertise the Sun newspaper, put that <laughs> behind me. Not that there aren't worse things one could advertise, but anyway, we'll leave that for another lecture as well. Um, but if we think of a generation or more ago. The study of science was accompanied by a sense of discovery. Man was landing on the moon. Huge computers made thousands of calculations a second. The basic genetic code had been broken. Major infectious diseases had been defeated through antibiotics and vaccination. Concord was flying at twice the speed of sound. And for the first time, we could watch colour TV transmitted live from around the world. But actually, last week, a document full of scientific insight for this generation, written admittedly by an economist, dominated the news. As Martin said, the Stern report set out unanswerably the scientific case that our actions are changing our climate. And it might have been a pessimistic document, but in fact, full of can-do optimism. And one of its implications was this, that if, as an idealistic young person, you wanted to change the world, then become a scientist. Politics will be necessary, but insufficient. It won't be enough to negotiate and regulate. We need a new generation's expertise in carbon capture and storage, euclid possibly fusion, microgeneration, biomass, advanced battery technology, hydrogen use and fuel cells. Sensors and tracking technologies will fortify our defences against natural hazards and weather variations. The science of climate change is, if you like, the moon landing of our day. It is idealism in a technical language. The scientists and the idealists will once again be the same people. The discoveries in the laboratory will be matters of life and death for the planet. Nothing could be more vital, nothing could be more exciting. Recently, the government's foresight programme set an agenda for future action on science, working out new strategies in flood and coastal defence, exploiting the electromagnetic spectrum in cyber trust and crime prevention, 
in areas of addiction and drugs, the detection and identification of infectious disease, tackling obesity, sustainable management of energy, even mental well-being, <coughs> advances in the sorting of particles using lattices of light herald the advent of lab-on-a-chip technologies. These chips would support diabetes and cancer treatment and aid drug targeting. Institute diagnostics will permit us to arrest some diseases before clinical symptoms even appear. Much earlier diagnoses will be possible for diabetes, Alzheimer's, age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts. New sequences of genetic material can control vital aspects of cellular chemistry. DNA vaccines for AIDS, malaria, hepatitis B, and some cancers are now in clinical trials and could even be available in five to ten years. Advances in our understanding of brain functions will produce a better understanding of degenerative conditions such as dementia. It will enhance our understanding of the effects of recreational drugs <coughs> and the propensity to addiction. Information technologies will make a national infrastructure of identity possible, contributing to increased detection rates and reduced fraud. But then secure technologies, such as cryptography, will protect data access and use. Nanotechnologies will allow us to manipulate materials at a molecular level Nanosensors will increase our ability to monitor the conditions of buildings to assess the cleanliness of food and water and the health of plants, humans and animals. Smart materials that will be able to indicate when they are in need of repair. Technology, I'm told, that may even keep drivers in the right lane and at a safe distance from other vehicles. All of this is extraordinarily rich in possibility but also vital for our economic prosperity. I've remarked many times that change in the modern era is quicker than ever before, and actually is the single most difficult thing about policy making in today's world. There is a greater economic premium, therefore, on innovation than there has ever been. Hence, we need to nurture our capacity for ingenuity, and then we need to turn it to practical, often commercial, use. In the 19th century, Britain's industrial hegemony was made possible by the inventors of Lancashire, Arkwright's spinning jenny, Kay's flying shuttle, Crompton's spinning mule. But frankly, ever since that time, the UK has been slow to turn its technological and scientific creativity to economic purpose. After World War I, there was a big shift in the basis of production. Britain was at the forefront of the revolution in ingenuity but we didn't create the same amount of economic benefit. And actually the same was true after the Second World War. Our challenge this time, therefore, for this age, is to couple science and economic purpose. Now, what has happened, what needs to happen? The science budget has more than doubled from 1.3 billion to 3.5 billion in less than a decade. The number of science undergraduates in the UK has gone up by a quarter since 1997. The research budget itself has doubled. We've invested since 1999 three billion pounds in the university science infrastructure. The Technology Strategy Board has supported over 500 collaborative R&D projects with 600 million pounds worth of investment. And expenditure on R&D has increased in real terms by more than 20% in the last 10 years. But Compared to our competitors, it's still low. We have an ambition, therefore, to increase overall R&D from 1.9% of GDP, where it is now, to 2.5% by 2014, which is an ambitious target. We've been, I think, the first government to set out a long-term vision in science. The 10-year science and innovation investment framework set out our ambition to make the UK the premier destination for science and innovation. And we have a deserved reputation for scientific excellence. In seven of the ten major areas of research, the UK lags behind only the US. We have more entries in the top 50 world universities than the rest of Europe put together. However, it's still only five. In biomedical science, we're three of the top five universities in the world. Our record for academic citations is very good. Our biotechnology sector is now the most mature in Europe. 450 businesses 
are employing over 20,000 people and raise revenues of over 2.5 billion. Our pharmaceuticals industry has discovered and developed more leading medicines again than the rest of Europe put together. And there are a number of reasons for this. We have a skilled workforce, a fair regulatory framework, generous tax relief on R&D, and I think a good dialogue between government, universities, business and strong financial markets. This is a winning combination, and as was said earlier, a good example is stem cell research. The UK Stem Cell Bank, the first of its type in the world, is responsible for storing, characterising and supplying stem cell lines for research and ultimately for treatment. It is funded through the research councils to the value of two and a half million pounds. In the budget of 2005, the Chancellor announced the establishment of the UK Stem Cell Initiative and in December of last year, it published 11 recommendations to us which were accepted in full. And as a result of that, we've allocated an additional 50 million, bringing our total investment up to 100 million between 2006 and 2008. Unfortunately, however, research capability can migrate quickly. The UK is a higher percentage of business R&D funded from abroad than any other nation in the G7. We're already very open, but the international competition is intense and it's getting more intense. Chinese research and development has been rising by 20% a year over the past five years. South Korean research and development has increased tenfold in the last 30 odd years. Indian research and development has trebled, trebled in a decade. Indian engineers are flooding into the world's markets. 350,000 a year, forecast to rise to 1.4 million over the next 10 years. It's a warning to us, therefore, that we have to remain world leaders and that knowledge also needs to be transferred from the academy to the marketplace. I think there is real progress of the spin-outs from universities to business. But let's be, be frank, again, we need to do much more. 25 spin-outs from the UK universities were floated on the stock market with a combined value of over 1.5 million, just billion, just in the last three years. The Higher Education Innovation Fund provides 110 million a year to help universities put their research in the forefront of business. UK universities now produce roughly equivalent numbers of patents as their US counterparts, and they also produce a far higher number of spin-outs per £1 million pounds of research. Since 1997, the value of collaborative research between universities and business has increased by more than 50%, and now 20 knowledge transfer networks are being supported to bring together science and business communities. When I spoke at the Royal Society back in May 2002, I talked about the strength of our biotechnology industry and our plans for supporting the emerging nanotechnology industry. I'm glad that, as I said earlier, UK biotechnology remains the most successful in Europe and is second globally only to the US. Just under a half of public biotechnology companies in Europe are in the UK, and we have three times more than our nearest rival, Germany. The UK nanotechnology industry is also growing rapidly. In July 2003, we announced a £90 million project to support the creation over six years of a network of open access facilities to provide the essential tools of the trade and a major programme of applied research. We also announced the formation of the Micro and Nanotechnology Network. And as a result, in part at least, of all these measures, the nanotechnology industry, the Micro and Nanotechnology industry, has doubled in size from £11 billion in those years to £23 billion for the financial year 2005-2006. Today, again, it employs over 20,000 people and is supporting a further quarter of a million who are employed in manufacturing sectors that depend on nanotechnology or microsystems. So, overall, there are good signs of a new set of technology-based UK businesses and of inward investment by foreign firms attracted, at least in part, by the quality of UK science. However, this competition is intense, and truthfully, we have weaknesses. The UK has failed to develop any major new technology-based companies in the past decade. Total venture, total venture capital investment in early stage technology companies is not increasing, and business research and development not rising as a share of GDP. There is a message, I think, 
Not just the business, but the scientists here too. You need to think intellectually, but also commercially. There is still a significant cultural difference between the UK and the US. In the US, it is common for science scientists to design a research programme specifically to answer the questions posed by businesses. In the UK, that connection is too often made later in the process. We need to push on with initiatives like Higher Education Innovation Fund and the Technology Strategy Board. But we need to do much more. I want to say to you that today, I think as part of our forward policy process, we must consider how to use public procurement after all, public sector bodies spend around £150 billion a year on procurement. We must use public sector procurement to stimulate innovation and help small companies develop fast. Again, we have concentrated on raising the level of innovation in manufacturing. We need to do the same today for services. And last week, Alistair Darling announced the Global Science and Innovation Forum strategy that Sir David King has been chairing. The purpose of this is to make the UK the first choice for business investment in R&D and for foreign universities and scientists. In addition, we will be creating stronger international ties with China and India by extending our UK-US Science Bridges schemes to them. The first International UK Research Council office will open in Beijing next year. And we are working with the Royal Society to establish a new high-profile prestigious international fellowship an alumni scheme, firmly to establish the UK as partner of choice for scientific collaboration in the 21st century. So, the basis for world-class science is in place. The ideas are moving better from the laboratory to the marketplace. The standard account of British scientific history, good on ingenuity, not so good at translating it into commerce, is slowly being confounded. But nothing in a modern economy is forever. And there are two things in particular that threaten the strong position that we have attained. The first is perhaps the most difficult issue of all. Government must show leadership and courage in standing up for science and rejecting an irrational public debate around it. Imagine if the MRI scanner had been known by the name that is often used by researchers, the NMR, imaging device, the nuclear magnetic resonance machine. It might have been a different type of debate altogether. Yet in many instances, a powerful and vocal lobby with access to all the media channels and an interest in polarising the argument frames the debate. And just from the political leader's point of view, I should say to you that standing up to this is harder than it sounds. But it is a classic example of the struggle between short-term politics and long-term public good. If we hadn't taken on the animal rights extremists, for example, we might well have lost essential scientific research to Britain with incalculable economic damage to the country, to say nothing of the value of the research in the treatment of disease. But in a sense, that was an argument because of the extremism and violence that was used that we could easily enough win. Harder, frankly, are the areas of genuine intellectual controversy. We have only opened back up the nuclear power debate, in my view, just in time. There is no way, frankly, that we can guarantee energy security or cleaner power without it. At least on genetically modified drugs, we remain strong as a country. But the misconceptions, often born of the most outrageous distortion of fact by campaigners who, in accusing others of a lack of scruple, show precious little of it themselves, can be so pervasive. They so easily take hold. Combating them, of course, is a job for politics. But what I want to say to you today is that combating them also takes the world of science to engage fully and clearly and in simple language the world outside it. We need scientists willing and able to explain, to reason, to give the scientific facts not by arrogant assertion but by patience and also by accurately reflecting 
where science is fact and where science is still conjecture. Britain as a whole must become a scientifically literate society. It's not just something for scientists, it's something for all of us. Not just those who are going to engage their whole lives in the study of science, but for those who are going to be affected by that study of science. This is not simply about growing the next generation of scientists. It's also about conditioning all of us to a reasoned understanding of what science can do for us, to dispel the myths, calm the scares. Let us make our moral judgments, of course, but make them at least partially on the basis of the fact. The anti-science brigade, in my view, threatens our progress and our prosperity. And we need political and science leadership that stands up for them. BSE, GM Foods, MMR, stem cell. The variable experiences of all these different controversies have given us a template of how to conduct a rational conversation about science and sometimes, frankly, how not to. In government, we need to try to follow the best ways of conducting these debates and then trust to the good judgment of the public. We need first to ensure we hear scientific truth told to power in government. That was one of the reasons why following the Phillips report into BSE in the year 2000, we appointed chief scientific advisors in all major departments. We opened up scientific advisory committees to greater scrutiny. We created, of course, the Independent Food Standards Agency that John Krebs did so much to make credible, to ensure we transfer the best scientific knowledge to matters of obvious sensitivity to the public. And then, frankly, in any of these big debates, we need to engage the public at a very early stage. The reaction to stem cell research, I think, gives us grounds for optimism. Unlike the debate over GM foods, the public were engaged early enough and the argument has duly been conducted rationally. But we then also need to be clear about the benefits to individuals. The anti-GM lobby does not campaign against GM human insulin because the benefits to people with diabetes are obvious. The acceptability of stem cell research links to the fact that people can see how it can help treat illness. But we also have to be honest about risks. We cannot claim that any new technology is, in inverted commas, absolutely safe. It never is. The media may demand certainty, but science can't provide it, and we should not pretend it can. And also, we need to be sensitive to the fact that some risks, especially where children are involved, elicit more anxiety than others, irrespective of the scientific assessment. When these conditions are in place, a genuinely open, rational dialogue is possible. But as I say, this is so much easier if science has a broader reach into our culture and into our society. Today I've exhorted young people to be alive to the wonder of science. I've described the way that science will serve idealism for the next generation. We also have a responsibility to make that possible by providing a first-class science education system. Here, the recruitment of teachers has been an undoubted problem. As John was saying, there's a shortage of maths and science teachers qualified in the specialism they teach. 26% of maintained 11 to 16 schools have no physics specialists and 12% no chemistry specialists. Nearly a quarter of those teaching maths were non-specialists. Only 19% of science teachers specialise in physics and they tend, as a rule, to have lower degree qualifications. That's why, a couple of years ago, in the 10-year Science and Innovation Investment Framework, we made science skills a priority, and we included a range of new policies to stimulate the recruitment, specifically, of science teachers. The Next Steps programme specifies targets for lessons to be taught by specialist subjects. Subject specialists, I should say. There is already some progress. Science teacher vacancies are already falling, and last year, 7,500 new science teachers were hired, which is 70% more than five years ago. There has also been a lot of publicity about the new science GCSE. It's been developed with the support of many eminent scientists, including the Royal Society. Of course, students will continue to learn important scientific facts and knowledge, but I think the idea 
is that they will do so in a way that also engages them through understanding scientific controversy. And by engaging more young people with science, it will encourage more to continue science at A-level or through the new specialised diplomas. <coughs> it may well also be that as the international baccalaureate develops alongside A-level, then too there is the possibility of people not to be corralled into too narrow a specialisation between the ages of 16 and 18. At the same time, we are giving a new right to students who gain above average grades in the key stage three tests at age 14 to study triple science, physics, chemistry and bio biology individually. They will have that entitlement from 2008. We've also recently announced a multi-million pound package to encourage more young people from the age of nine to the age of 21 to take an interest in science. And that fund will be used to improve careers advice, offer a new interdisciplinary science degree, combining core physics with applied science and developing things like technology clubs at the weekends and so on. So, to summarize, this country is very well placed. We have once again rediscovered the secret of the first industrial revolution by bringing scientific discovery and entrepreneurial activity together. We have at least inched towards a more rational public discourse about science and risk. And we're making progress on educating the next generation of scientists. But we have far more work to do. We need to concentrate on achieving the ambitious targets set out in that 10-year plan. We need to do more to foster links between universities and business. We can reduce the bureaucracy that universities face and enable our best universities to bid for the best of the world's scientific talent. We could do a lot more with government and the public sector to use public procurement to pull through innovation. But finally, the thing that will link all of this together and make Britain the most welcoming place for science is if we galvanise the young people by claiming the great possibilities of science. We need to make science popular again, popular in the sense of closer to where people are, more accessible to people, more easily comprehensible, more exciting for them. Recently we've seen some excellent popular books, Steve Jones for example, Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawking and Bill Bryson, who's a short history of nearly everything, sold over two million copies and which was sent to every secondary school. The BBC and the Open University have some excellent science services. Google Earth, as anyone knows, is a wonder to behold. You know, in the 19th century, working civil engineers like Isambard Kingdom Brunel were national figures, not for writing about science, but actually for what they achieved. We need our scientists today to be as celebrated and famous as our sportsmen and women, our actors, our business entrepreneurs. <coughs> The scientists who are going to sit down and produce the medical breakthroughs of the future tackle climate change, help us solve the multiplicity of problems that globalisation throws up for us, economically, socially, culturally. Those scientists, the young people who are going to study the science that they are pioneering, those people are indeed the pioneers of the new frontier for our world today in the early 21st century. They are stars just as much as those that we celebrate and give fame to more usually in our society today. When I was at the Synchrotron facility yesterday, I came away, well, I came away with the same thing I always come away, having spent two or three hours in the company of scientists, which is a severe inferiority complex. <laughs> but I also came away, uh, came away utterly inspired by the possibilities of what it had to offer, but also the imagination it took to create it. What fascinated me, and it's only seeing it that the fascination was clear, because after all, some years before, I remember we actually signed off the document so this was something done in government with which I was intimately connected. But I remember even under David's um, brilliant tutelage, when this was explained to me, 
and there was a big debate about where it should be situated and so on, and very controversial it was. And even then, I couldn't really quite grasp its possibilities. When I visited it yesterday, it was, in a sense, the vision of those who had the imagination to create it that leapt out at me most. And that's what our world needs today. It, it moves so fast, it changes so fast. Countries like ours are subject to so many forces that are changing it day in, day out. If you think what my children, your children, the children here, are growing up with in terms of technology, it's just things we couldn't even have dreamt of when we were growing up. And most of us certainly, my age, don't like to think of us as that old. And yet it's an incredible thing to think that in 10, 15, 20 years' time, and certainly when the young people here today are my age, that it may have all revolutionised and changed again. Now, for us as a country, what have we always been good at? We've been good with our brain, our wisdom, our knowledge, our skill. That's how a small country like this ended up having such influence in the world. Today, that same spirit lives on not in empires and in things that are part of our history, but it can live on in the process of scientific discovery and application. This, in my view, is Britain's path to the future. It's lit by the brilliant light of science, and it's a future that I personally look forward to. Thank you. almost half an hour for questions, and I'd like to invite these. Um, we're going to take the questioning groups of three, and if you want to ask a question, please wait till the microphone reaches you. Please then give your name, and then give your question, but keep it very short, please. We want to get through as many questions as we can during the half hour the Prime Minister's here. So, can we have the first question? Yes. Right over there. I'm a, I'm a beneficiary of an English science company, and I've recently set up a biotech company. But the limitation is that, as you say, is really skilled, motivated young people. And I wonder what the government is going to do about motivating uh, teachers, changing their careers, making them more flexible and interactive, uh, so that we might get more informed uh, information at the classroom level that will feed into this. Yes. Um, second one there, and third one there. Fiona Fox, Director of the Science Media Centre. Prime Minister, you haven't always enjoyed the most happy relationship with the media. Um, and I wonder what message you have for those scientists who, who want to take up your call to arms that you've made so passionately and persuasively today and want to engage in the debates you refer to, but still have a fear and dread of doing so through the vagaries of the mass media. Right. Third question up there. Thank you. This is Brian, Prime Minister Alex Fernandez here. Um, in an age where patents become as important as nature papers and spin offs keep the department of that university alive, how can you make sure that curiosity driven science continues to happen knowing that putting money in basic research is not enough when the incentive system pushes towards more short term vision in science? You can see me like this. Um, first of all, to, to uh, the person who asked about how we, we um, motivate young people to get the skills and so on, um, I mean, I think this is a long-term process which is partly about the new science and technology specialist colleges. It's partly about um, getting some of our, um, you know, the, the, curing some of the problems we've had, for example, with the, the attraction of science teachers and the quality of science teachers, and we're doing all of that through um, the various incentives that we're, we're now employing. And it's partly about things like, for example, I just opened in York, we, 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 we've opened a new science learning centre where teachers who teach science can go for residential courses to this centre 
and then they can learn about all the new discoveries and everything. And it's a fantastic thing. I mean, it's really interesting for um, teachers to do. And so you're kind of trying to raise the status also of science teaching within school. I mean, I personally do think there is a long-term problem with, with the, the, the narrowness um, of, of uh, you know, people specialising very sharply after the age of 16. But let me tell you what I think is the single most important thing for young people. And sometimes when you, you go outside a particular world of science, because I'm obviously of the world of science, you, you can see these things more clearly. What young people today have got to know is actually about your story. Because you've got your own company, right? And you're doing great things with it, right? Young people, I mean, when I was a young person leaving university, right, you, you, went, you, you, you went into banking or accountancy or law, I mean, I'm not saying anything against lawyers and certainly, um, but not um, for obvious reasons, but um, the fact is a lot of youngsters don't know the job opportunities, you know, the commercial opportunities in science. I mean, people, I know, that, and this may sound somewhat insulting, and I don't mean it to be, to, to the scientists that are here, but young people have got to know, to put it absolutely crudely, there are also money-making opportunities in science. Not that that's necessarily why they go into it, but it's, they need to know there's a career that is not just about pure science, but is also about commercial development. And one of the ideas that, 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 that I've had is actually, you know, because a lot of our careers advice is very sort of static, is, is if you've got some of our, um, the new generation of, of biotech and science entrepreneurs actually to go into schools and explain what type of business they're running and the things they're engaged in. I mean, any young person who visited the, the, the company <coughs> I visited yesterday, Regenitech, I think it was called, I mean, would have been immensely excited by the business as well as the science, you know, the combination of the two. And I think that's very, very important. And we've got to cure this, because if we don't end up with getting good young people studying science at school and then at university, the rest of it can't succeed. And I agree, we've got a long way to go. Um, in relation to, yeah, the vagaries of the mass media, I think we've just got to stand up to it when it happens. Um, but we need the scientific community to stand alongside us. Look, I can't, you know, a politician can't win the debate on science. Scientists and politicians can win the debate on science. And we need to be able, when, you know, scare stories happen or misconceptions are, are around, for, for us to have a, a, a plan that allows us to, to debate this rationally. I mean, the single most difficult thing in politics today is conducting a rational debate outside of headlines. That is the single most difficult thing. I mean, not just in this area, but throughout it. And the truth is, it's one of the reasons for doing this series of lectures, is that you become, in my position, incredibly frustrated. You know, everyone talks about, you know, spin and inverted commas and politics. The reason why politicians end up, you know, having to hire reams of press people and all the rest of it, is that otherwise you can't, you know, you're engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat the entire time with stories leaping at you in 24-7 hour media, headline, and it's battle by headline. When you've got a subject, let's take it like GM or nuclear power, it, it can't work by headline. You've got to explain to people. I mean, why is it that, that people have resistance to a lot of these things? It's not because people have gone into the science of it. In a sense, you may, you may decide, having known the science, that you're totally against nuclear power, for example. Fair enough. But actually, what we do know for sure is that a lot of the opposition is based on a series of misconceptions about it, that if people really had the chance to, to understand it, at least they would make, they might still make the same judgment. At least they make the judgment somewhere approximating to the facts. And I think, you know, what we have to do, therefore, this is the, one of the purposes what I wanted to say today, is we've got to, you know, we have got to engage, but you have got to engage with the outside world in a far more disciplined way so that for example when we began this issue over nanotechnology we then did go into the you know we went into it in a better more disciplined way and that's the only way of overcoming what you and um, diplomatically call the vagaries of the mass media um, as for the the, the, uh, the the last point I mean I think we do need pure pure science and we do, do need to Well,
the Higgins are completely wrong. Yeah. Just one I just wanted to comment on, which is Kay Daly's point. I think we, the scientific community, that is particularly the professional science community in research, bears a responsibility. I am very struck about the disconnect between science teachers in schools and the science community as a whole. I was, for a short time, a science teacher myself a long time ago. And it's quite a lonely place, and it doesn't have its connections into the research base. And if we really want to excite the teachers and the students, I think we've got to work very hard at that set of connections and embrace the teachers properly into, as it were, the people that are represented here, the academy, the researchers, and the people who are in industry. So that's my strong view. Let's take two more questions. Uh, first there, second over there. Prime Minister, does the government intend to implement Dr. Evan Harris's excellent idea of placing a this product to be tested on animals label on medicines, thereby increasing the public's awareness of the importance of animal based research? Uh, My name is Ian Harley. I used to be the chief executive of BTG, the company which commercialized MRI and in fact did the rebranding from NMR to MRI. 70% uh, of the value of UK companies quoted on the stock market rests in their IP, patents, trademarks, and copyright. Uh, the Prime Minister Wen Jibao, uh, when he met him recently, said competition of the future is competition in IP. He said that many, many times. China spends two, is planning to spend 2.5% of its GDP on R&D. It's also set in a target of being in the top five of IP owners by 2015. Doing research and development without IP is uh, a philanthropic activity. Uh, will the Gow's report address what more can the government do to understand the central role of IP in a knowledge-based economy and what more can it do to, to reinforce the knowledge of IP? Looking at China, where they start educating their school children at primary level in what IP is about. Question right at the back there. Thank you, Chris Lever. Um, we are very grateful for government support, certainly locally, against the animal extremists. But I come from a community uh, which has been involved in public debates on GM crops. We have also <coughs> suffered from extremism, destruction of field trials, the companies have. There have been no field tests on GM crops, yet nine million farmers are growing them worldwide. And this is going to be extremely important to solve, or at least address, at least in part, many of the challenges which you have talked about earlier on today. I wonder what the view of the government is and how we can get this right. Um. Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure I could um, that it would be right for government actually to oblige companies to to do this. Um, what what, what Adam Harris is, is suggesting. However, I think the basic point, mm. which is to try and educate people about the benefits um, and the necessity in certain circumstances of animal-based research, is right. <coughs> and it's also important to say that we 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 have eliminated cosmetic testing, and we have probably the strictest rules here of any country in the world, um, but it is important, um, as I've seen for myself, that we don't um, exclude this and we give protection to people who are engaged in it, and also, don't allow this, this I think, really this, this, this quite false um, um, misconception to arise that people who are engaged in animal-based research don't care about animals, they do, but it, the research work that they're doing is absolutely of vital importance. And I think actually from the work that you personally did in, in leading a sort of public-based campaign was a very good example of how, uh, um, how there can be a fight back sometimes more effectively from outside the world of politics than from inside it. Um, I, uh, I agree with um, what, what our colleague who, who used to run BTG was saying. Um, the Gowers report will deal with this in part. We also need a European patent. We need to, to get rid of this ridiculous situation in Europe, which is holding us back 
tremendously. Um, I, I think we may do this actually in the next couple of years, I, I hope so. And the other thing we need to do is of course bind everyone into an, into an international system of protection of inter intellectual property. Um, you know, it is correct that China is investing an immense amount in R&D, but it's also important we protect our own intellectual property uh, worldwide. And this is also where, incidentally, you know, the, um, for example, the, the, what we have been able to do here in Europe, but also increasingly the international push to deal with, with issues to do with sort of piracy, uh, and theft of intellectual property are really, really important. And here again, you know, something that people don't always understand. I mean, when we're talking about the pharmaceutical industry, for example, um, you know, you get into a debate about the, the price of drugs within the UK and the National Health Service and so on. Now, there are always a tough and hard-headed negotiation, as indeed there should be, when the government's negotiating with private enterprise over the money that it's paying out. But actually, there's, a, there's often a failure to understand in the public debate that you, you do need also to have a system that encourages the investment in research. And so intellectual property is, is a very, very important part of that. As I say, the Gowers report, I think, will inform um, government policy on it. But I, I think it would be, we would make a big difference in this if Europe spoke with one voice and had a proper European-wide pattern, because I think that would give us weight then in the international negotiations on these issues of intellectual property. And finally, to deal with um, the point on, on GM, I think the reason why this, this happened was that we, we weren't, I mean, if I'm honest about it, I don't think we were prepared for what came at us. And so if you wanted to go back into the whole debate, about genetic modification. I think you go back into it via the basic science and explanation of what it is and modifying within species, modifying across species. You explain the benefits in relation to drugs and you then build back out. Um, but I think in relation to bioscience, it would be a terrible mistake if this country did not exploit its tremendous position and advantage here. And as I've often said, it may well be um, that in relation to um, you know, large-scale commercial and agricultural production, this, this country, for all sorts of reasons, is in a different position from countries like America or Brazil. But there is a... When I... Um, there is a warning here for us. I mean... When, when I gave the, the, the speech on science to the Royal Society four and a bit years ago, I said at the time, I was just rereading the speech uh, early this morning, and I recall what, what it was that triggered my desire to make that speech. And it was visiting Bangalore, and this must, been, this must have been early 2002, and seeing in the south of India what they were doing there, which is kind of first world alongside third world a lot of the time. And I remember having a meeting with a whole lot of... Um, bioscientists and entrepreneurs there who just told us, we, 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 you Europeans, you've gone crazy over this whole GM business and we're, gonna, we're just going to knock you aside um, in the competition in the future. And now I think we have managed to pull our position back um, on bioscience, but we do not, you know, we, 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 we can't afford either here or in Europe to send out signals on, on this that are adverse to a sensible discussion and sensible scientific development. There are all sorts of issues, incidentally. I mean, all sorts of issues that need to be properly debated. Um, but one thing I think is very clear for people who are engaged in, in cutting-edge science and linked to business is that if they think the country that they're going to be working in has turned against science, then they tend not to want to come, unsurprisingly. So the... the the atmosphere, the climate within which um, these companies come here and work here is very, very important. And, and I hope we can learn the lesson of what happened over GM and make a better and more sensible progress on it in the future. I wonder if the science minister wanted to comment on it. No, no. no. <laughs> Let, <laughs> right. Let's have one, one more round of questions. Uh, Imperial College. Um, now that Nick Stern has really concentrated our minds on climate change, 
What can the government do to foster scientific work on its consequences? Let's take, let's take one, one there, and then the third one over there. Uh, Prime Minister, in recent years we've seen some high-profile closures of science departments in universities. The chemistry department of Exeter has been a big fuss about chemistry in Sussex and just down the road. Reading is talking about closing physics. Have we done enough on the funding package to make sure that our universities can remain world-class and internationally competitive? Sorry, yes. Uh, there's a, a younger voice just behind here. First of all, in relation to, to, to climate uh, change, there's a whole series of things that uh, Gordon Brown announced to, to, um, in terms of collaborative work on science change. We are also investing an immense amount in research and development for renewable technologies. Um, there are two other things, however, that are going to be important. First of all, the European Institute of, Te of, of Technology that um, the President of the European Commission has suggested establish me. He wants that to have a, a, a particular dimension in respect of the work on climate change. The biggest thing we could do, though, is to create an international binding framework that, that says we are going to move to a low-carbon economy, because that will incentivize not just governments, but also business to get into this. And one of the most bizarre conversations I've had um, in the last, and I have a lot of them as Prime Minister, um, <laughs> in, uh, in the last um, year or so, was meeting a lot of the major American power companies, all of whom are now supportive of a binding framework for greenhouse gas emissions uh, post the expiry of the Kyoto Protocol. And the reason for that is that they're sitting there, I mean, they want to be responsible people, they're sitting there saying, if you give us the right framework and incentivize us, if we know that carbon's going to have a price and the market mechanism is going to be there to make it commercially viable for us to go into low carbon product, we'll get there. You know, but we need to know that everyone's playing by the same rules. And the, the reason why I did this G8 thing last year is that the, the problem with Kyoto is, is twofold, quite apart from the fact that it doesn't, although it's an amazing and pioneering piece of diplomacy at one level. It, it doesn't reduce uh, the emissions in the way that it needs to. But secondly, it doesn't have America in it. And you know, one's got to be very uh, blunt about this. There are an awful lot of other countries who hide behind America on this. Um, the truth is, it, the reality of American politics is that they will not back a framework internationally agreed unless it's got China and India in it. And that's for a simple reason. I mean, the Chinese economy is growing very fast. They're immensely competitive. They're taking over markets of the US and Europe and elsewhere. And if people think we're going to be subject to something and they're not, there's going to be a problem. Now, to be fair to the Chinese, I think they have an absolutely keen, indeed, I would say, enthusiastic desire to play their full part in this. But they also need access to the technology. There's a new coal-fired power station being built in China virtually every week. You know. If we shut down all of the, I mean, everything in this country, shut the whole thing down, right? This, you know, occasionally I think some people would like us to do, shut it, the, the whole thing down, the emissions growth from China in, I don't know, less than two years, I think, would, would, would wipe out the gain. So the only way of doing this is an international agreement. And the important thing about this is that if we end up getting an international agreement that's got the G8 plus five in it, that's the G8 countries, which is Japan and Canada, um, the uh, um, uh, America and then the main um, European countries and Russia. If you, 
If you take those countries and add to them China and India and Brazil and South Africa and Mexico, you've got effectively 70% of the world's emissions within those countries. Now, what I tried to do last year, and we're now carrying this forward with the German presidency, and I've got a meeting with the uh, German chancellor later today, um, at which this will be raised, is to try and get those 13 countries to agree a framework that we can then take out and get agreed by the international community. But for the first time, it's a framework that's got China and India as well as America in it. Anything else, in my view, won't work. But if you get that, then the very thing you're talking about will happen because there will be an immense desire for people to invest in the science of combating climate change. Um, in relation to the science departments, I think there is a, a, a real point here, and we need to look very carefully. I know we aren't looking very carefully at what can be done, because obviously it's important. With all the extra funding that's going in, we need to make sure that we're, we're, we're spreading it in the right way. And I do know there's, there, there, there have been significant problems about that. And then finally, to, to uh, the young person who, who um, very frankly, says you, you want to be rich as well as have a sort of great visionary, uh, well, it's not a bad thing. Um, as, as, as well as save the world or whatever. Or maybe you don't want to save the world, you just want to be rich. But anyway, <laughs> whichever it is. Actually, let me just tell you something, because this is where, from the first question to the last, there is a read across. Let me tell you, there are people in science that I know, because you, you meet them. You know, when you go to a business, you get a business gathering today, um, if I have a business sort of summit in Downing Street, even 10 years ago when I had the summer, right, all the guys were there in the traditional suit and tie and they were all, they all they were like great neon signs above their head saying business executive. Right? You have the same meeting in Downing Street today and you'll always have three or four of them that will either be casually dressed or obviously don't look like business people at all. But they may be the wealthiest people in the room. But some of them will have been scientists that will have then developed their ideas. And the work that scientists are doing today in research, never mind um, actually those that have decided to become entrepreneurs, I can tell you they are making money and they're doing extremely well. And part of the trouble is young people don't know enough about it. And I can tell you today there is a huge number of people competing for a small number of places in the law. Um, but there are fantastic opportunities in industry and business and science. And, you know, one of the things, I mean... Um, I mean, I, look, because I've got um, kids of roughly that age, and although my children haven't studied science, but I say to them the whole time, you know, look at business and industry as much as anything else today. And actually, the cutting edge of business and industry is very much about the development of science. And if you saw that company I, I went to, the smaller company I went to yesterday, and you spoke, I don't know whether the guys are here because they could speak to you, but you sp spoke to those guys, these are people who trained as engineers, uh, they then founded their own company, and they're engaged in really exciting work. And well, I, I don't want to embarrass them at all, but they didn't look poor. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I, th I think there is a I think there is a, there is a real case to look at how we give young people a far better understanding of what is available out there, because especially if you get something like this whole cl climate change business going, you're going to have an immense op a number of opportunities there. Do you know four years ago? We'd had 150,000 jobs in environmental technology. We've now got half a million. So there's been a 350,000 increase in four years. So I don't know, are you, are you at the A-level stage, are you? Right, you're in the AS. Well, there's plenty of time uh, to, to, to get out there and discover the new opportunities. And all I can say is if I was your age again, I, I, I know I'd be thinking about it. OK. I mean, I think that last question was terrific, and as somebody who works in the university, we get it all, all the time. But don't be dazzled by the glamour of law. <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> and the Prime Minister knows a lot about that. Um, of course, there's some wealthy ones. Think about the fulfilment. Where do you want to be in 10 or 15 years? The fulfilment that you can get out of uh, uh, science or engineering. The challenges are huge. That doesn't have the public sector, but I can t the, the public image. But I can tell you that the challenges that you meet day to day are huge. They are rewarding. 
And I've been to a number of spin-out companies, and if you want to make money, get in there, invent something new and take it to market. It is really exciting, and there's a lot of money as well. <laughs> Believe you me. Well, uh, we've run out of time, and uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone here if I say, first, we're grateful to the Prime Minister having decided to give a lecture on science policy as part of his series, and also for giving a lecture here which combined raising the issues of concern to scientists, but with many issues which are important for the nation in the long run. I think we found it a lecture which was sufficiently inspirational to be appropriate in this uh, place where sermons are often given, as well as being something which had issues addressed which are going to be important for the decade to come. So I'd like to ask you all to express your appreciation to the Prime Minister for his lecture.